All right, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. This is uh, Colleen Ignacio. I've got some motivated students with me today. We are going to be jumping into pharmacology. Pharmacology is a huge topic, but we're going to try our best to kind of break it down. And I just want to share some resources with you first. So this first uh, um, screen that you should be seeing is pictorial study aids. And when we focus on pharmacology, each of these are broken up to system. And for the medication, for example, cardiovascular medications, it has these pictorials or these visual aids, which will be very helpful if you are a visual learner. So here's just an example of what you could expect to see. So I have placed the link in the chat so you have access to these visual aids. And they're very good because they have kind of cool pictures that kind of help you understand how to study okay, or what to study, and also what are the nursing considerations, sometimes the diagnostic tests, the side effects, adverse side effects, those kinds of things. So just kind of flipping through the picture so you can see uh, what is there. So that was just an example for cardiovascular medications. If you were saying, you know, you're studying endocrine medications, here's some endocrine medications, um, and so again, here's some more pictures and it gives you some key tips, things to look out for, um, your nursing considerations, patient teachings, maybe we have to monitor blood work. So here's, you know, just uh, some examples again with the endocrine system. Okay, with the endocrine system. And I will submit to you when you are studying pharmacology, you should do it by, you should study by body systems. Okay, so that's the first resource I wanted to share with you. Another resource that I really uh, always share is the MedMaster podcast. This is by nursing.com. And this is a great resource because you can actually use this um, and you can have it on in the background. It's a Sunday, you might be outside getting some sunshine, but hey, put this on in the background. And these are the most, I think it's 140 medications most frequently seen for the NCLEX. So this is something that some of you are at the beginning of the nursing program, listen to this for your entire time in the nursing program, and something is going to be guaranteed to stick. I'm going to tell you, uh, just have it on. I wouldn't necessarily drive with this on because uh, the voice might kind of lull you to sleep, but um, I I do like it to be on in the background. And it gives you, you may be wondering, okay, what does this free podcast give you? Well, it gives you the generic name, which you have to know for your NCLEX. And it also gives you the therapeutic reason why a patient we would be prescribed this medication. It also tells you what are my nursing considerations. Maybe I have to monitor blood pressure. Maybe there's follow-up blood work. Maybe, um, I have to teach the patient about certain side effects. Maybe they have to take this medication first thing in the morning or an empty stomach. And then of course, um, again, any uh, side effects, uh, things that we have to look out for or adverse side effects, things that could harm the patient or cause fatality. So this is what the MedMaster podcast does for all of these medications you see listed here. And this is something that is free. All right, the next resource I want to share with you, and welcome, Miriam. Uh, the next resource I want to share with you is going to be Kathy Parks Level Up RN. I use her for pretty much everything. She has a great set of video series. She does have great pharmacology cards. She recently raised the price of her pharmacology cards, but I think it's well worth it. Uh, for the price of dinner and a movie, you can probably get the pharmacology cards. She also has a pharmacology uh, uh, playlist, which if you're getting ready for your pharmacology HESI, I would say just have this on and keep playing it and keep playing it because she tells you everything that you need to know and she's actually using her cards as she goes through her pharmacology videos. All right, the next resource I want to share with you is Remar. She's another one of my favorites that I follow. She has a, a number of pharmacology videos. It's not all encompassing, but they're quick uh, tidbits uh, that you can use to help you if you like Remar. 
Okay, so those are some of uh, the resources. Uh, Nexus Nursing is also another one, of, and she's really good because she has actual questions. So I probably should have had that one up too. Um, but while I get Nexus Nursing up, um, anybody have any questions or comments? And let me start with Miriam. Miriam, do you have any questions or comments? Okay, um, I don't hear anything from Miriam. So let me just share the Nexus Nursing and then we'll go to our next, uh, we'll go to our next thing. We go to Nexus Nursing. Okay, let's see. 14, which statement is a- Okay, I'm trying to get to her YouTube so I can share it with you. Okay, let's bring that on over. Okay, so she has a lot of uh, videos, but Nexus Nursing, she actually goes over NCLEX style questions with you and she breaks them down. Uh, and so this is gonna be another great resource for you. Um, and I know I'm just focusing on pharmacology now, but all of these uh, folks, nursing.com, Kathy Parks Level Up, they have excellent resources that you can use in all of your other classes, uh, including med surge, um, uh, and other classes as well. All right, well, we're going to go right to our pharmacology. Everybody should have access to this handout. I placed it in the chat for my class. I have uh, sent it to you. So I did not make this. This is from Remar. Okay, this is from Remar. And I'm going to use this kind of as my guide along with my pictorials to keep me grounded so we can get through these medications because there's a lot to get through. All right. First things first, uh, if you have any questions, also, you can definitely put them into the chat and I will be monitoring the chat as well. So we're going to jump right in and talk about analgesics. When I think about analgesics, I think about my patient that has pain. I think about that I have to rate the pain on a pain rating scale of zero to 10. Zero being no pain, 10 being the worst possible pain imaginable. And so depending on what my patient's pain is, that's going to determine the medication, the pain medication that I administer. So in this case, we're looking at non-opioid type. So the pain is there, but it's not severe pain. So this is mild to moderate pain, and we're talking about acetaminophen. Naproxen and our NSAIDs as well as aspirin. So when we think about the these class of medication, think about okay, think about it as a nurse. Why would I administer this class of medication? Because my patient has pain. Remember, I always have to ask follow-on questions about the pain. Where is the pain located? And let me just put this into the chat, the PQRST of pain. Where is the pain located? What makes it worse? Is there anything that relieves the pain? When did this pain start? Can you describe the pain? Is it gnawing? Is it um, dull? Is it sharp? Is it throbbing? Okay. And uh, how long have you had this pain? So all of those kinds of questions go with pain because when you take your pharmacology test, it may not just say, oh, here's a medication. It may give you a little bit of a scenario that you have to understand how to evaluate and use, you know, your first level of critical thinking. Okay. So why is the patient taking this pain medication? Well, this patient may have mild to moderate pain when we're talking about non-opioid uh, types of analgesics. So when we think about acetaminophen, and that is also Tylenol, but I'm going to try to stick with the generic names, acetaminophen, when we think about that, uh, we have to really understand that we have some concerns about liver function. Acetaminophen should not be given to patients that have liver issues, okay? And there is a limit depending on the patient's liver health on how much uh, or how many milligrams they should get per day. So it could be anywhere from three to 4,000. 3,000 milligrams um, if, or maybe even 2,000 milligrams if the patient is a liver patient, but no more than 4,000 milligrams per day. And so again, there is a limit and we have to think about liver function. So if you see the patient is taking acetaminophen every day, you have to determine, okay, is this safe for the patient's liver? 
Okay, that's going to be one of the first things that should pop into your mind. If the patient has maybe the scenario is the patient has taken a whole bottle of acetaminophen, we know that the antidote is going to be acetylcysteine. Okay, if the patient has uh, an overdose of acetaminophen, the antidote is acetylcysteine. And while I'm remembering, I'm going to put the... Um, worksheet for antidotes in the chat so you could also download that because that's going to be another one um on this in remar she does have um some antidotes listed but i'm going to use the one from nursing.com because it has a little bit more uh, as far as antidotes so let me just make sure i get that and put it into the chat for you just give me a second Okay, I don't see that one yet, but I'm going to put some other documents into the, the chat and I'm going to keep looking for it and I'll put it into the chat. Okay, so naproxen, when we talk about naproxen, there's an increased risk for heart attack and for stroke. So I would be very wary if my patient maybe is taking naproxen or prescribed naproxen and they have hypertension or if they have a cardiovascular history, I would definitely monitor their vital signs. Uh, that's going to be very important. So when we think about these safety points, these are the things that the test questions are made of. Do you understand things that could potentially go wrong, those potential complications, you have to be able to look out for that. And so when we think about pharmacology, it's more than just, okay, what is this medication? But we need to go a little bit deeper. Now, when we think about NSAIDs, um, a safety point for NSAIDs, when we think about it, we know that if a patient has been taking NSAIDs for a long time, they can thin the blood. They can thin the blood. So if a patient is getting ready for surgery, one of the things that the nurse is responsible for doing is educating the patient on, okay, please stop taking your NSAIDs maybe one or two weeks prior to your surgery or your procedure. Okay. With uh, NSAIDs and aspirin, they also not only have the antiplatelet uh, property, but we also have to monitor for ototoxicity. There is a risk for damage to the hearing. Okay, so if you have a question and it says the patient is taking NSAIDs or if they're taking aspirin and they have ringing in their ears, which is tinnitus, or if they have difficulty hearing or changes in their hearing, you should know that, okay, wow, this patient has ototoxicity. Now, something that's very specific for aspirin and the abbreviation for aspirin is ASA is Aspirin should not be given to pediatric patients 19 years and older. Uh, I'm sorry, 19 years old and younger should not be getting aspirin because it can cause a rise or raise syndrome. And so what can happen is with rise or raise syndrome, liver damage and brain damage. Okay, so that is a no-no. Do not give uh, aspirin to pediatric patients. Now, the other thing with NSAIDs, uh, they can cause GI bleeding. So we talked about stop taking a week or two before surgery, right? Whatever the doctor prescribes. But we, as nurses, we know that that's something we have to educate our patients on. Um, NSAIDs should not be taken with anticoagulants and they should take, the patient should take NSAIDs with food. Okay, I'm going to stop for a moment to see if there's any questions about this class of drugs, analgesics. I have a, a question about the 19 and under. Um, so in the in the pharmacology book, it says eight and under. So is it eight or 19 and under? Eight? Okay, that mm -hmm. is definitely not young enough. Okay, let me go to the American uh, Pediatrics. Okay, eight is way too young. Yeah, it said definitely not for children eight and under because of Ray's syndrome. So, but and when he said 19, I'm like, whoop, <laughs> that's, that's a big difference. Okay, yeah. So that's a great question. Let me check because I remember reading it on CDC website before or some other credible uh, site. So let me just make sure. Mm. Let's see, let's see. Kids shouldn't take aspirin. 
Okay, let's see if I can find it from Mayo Clinic. They're okay. Actually, they're one of the best. Okay, let me just put this here. Um, do, 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 do. Of course, I'm not going to find it quickly. Okay, let me see what Mayo Clinic is saying. I'm going to bring this over. Rare but serious. Okay, although aspirin should be older than age three and teenagers. So uh, through, okay, though aspirin is approved for use in children older than age three, children and teenagers recovering from chicken pox, okay, should never take aspirin. So that is specific. That is not giving me everything that I want. Okay, let me go to the American Pediatric Association. Okay, let's see what it tells us. Okay, I know I wasn't totally losing it okay so here we go um aspirin use in children for fever viral syndromes okay so in this um uh, always you want to use a credible source and i know your textbook is going to be the credible source that we use um but sometimes um, we have to look outside of the textbook. So let's see. All right, so aspirin should not be used to, uh, to treat acute febrile viral illnesses in children. And the risk of Ray syndrome decreases with age, um, extremely rare by late teenage years. Okay, aspirin use in children younger than 19 years should be limited to diseases in which aspirin has proven benefit, such as Kawasaki disease and juvenile arthritis. Okay. Um, so I understand what you're saying. And um I, out of an abundance of caution, I would not uh, give aspirin to children. If your textbook says eight years old, okay, go with that. But in real life, I mean, for your own families and your own pediatric patients, be very careful. And there's other things that we can give other than aspirin. So right. there's, as long as, you know, there's no allergies, but Yes. Does anybody else see that in their textbook? And I should look in the Saunders book also. Yeah, it it's definitely said um, that it was absolutely contraindicated in children eight and under. Like, don't give it at all because of the risk of Ray syndrome. Um, and I didn't, I didn't even know like that. Even up to nineteen, it wasn't um, something that you would give. So this is helpful. <laughs> Yes, yes. And again, um, you know, in case you see it on a question um, that I'm thinking the question is going to be, you know, um, the age is going to be well enough that you won't have to go back and forth because the, the bottom line is, do you know that this is not a medication to be given to children, to your pediatric patients? Okay. Nope. Yeah. So hopefully we don't get um, maybe a question that someone is like eight and a half or nine and it's, you know, you're on the edge. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for Thank asking you. that question. You're welcome. Okay, let me go back. All right, anybody else have any questions? Okay, all right, we're going to jump into our other type of uh, pain medication, our analgesics, but these are the opioid type, okay? We think about narcotics, we think about they're well-controlled, we think about that this is a two-nurse count, I'm thinking that no one should disturb me when I'm with that other nurse and we're doing our narcotics count, this is something that requires our full attention, and if you are doing a count with a nurse, make sure you visualize every single vial, every single pill, if if there's maybe sometimes there's certain narcotics that are in the refrigerator, go to the refrigerator and visualize it with that nurse. Don't say, oh, yeah, I trust that. 
don't trust when it comes to narcotics don't trust anyone okay don't trust anyone because unfortunately we do have uh, impaired nurses that are pocketing uh, medications now i'm just going to mention impaired nurse in case that is a scenario that you see on your HESI because i'm not sure what you'll see if there is a nurse there's a scenario where maybe this nurse whenever she works all of her patients get their prn uh, pain medication uh, opioids and the patients are still crying out for pain or you know it's a scenario that's like that you don't confront the nurse it doesn't matter if you're an LPN or an RN what you need to do is report it to the next person in your chain of command so if you're an LPN you'll report it to the supervising RN or you'll report it to the charge nurse or you'll report it to um, you know whoever is next in the chain of command based on the answer choices but you never want to confront that nurse because that's not your job and when you confront someone with something like that you don't know how they will respond and we don't want to escalate any situations okay all right so when we think about these medications that includes your morphine your hydromorphone your codeine hydromorphone is the lauded uh your codeine your uh, meropyridine which is um going to be your demerol and then your oxycodone when we think about these medications, we will not give these medications if the patient has a decreased respiratory rate. Remember that our normal respiratory rate for an adult is 12 to 20. So if their respiratory rate is already depressed, we're not going to give this because this is going to cause further respiratory depression and can actually harm your patient. Okay, we want to also monitor our patient for constipation if they're taking these opioid medications. And opioid medications are for severe pain. So this is like, you know, your post-surgical patient, maybe a cancer patient that would be receiving this kind of uh, very strong uh, medication. Okay, I'm going to pause for a second. Are there any questions? No, ma'am. Okay. All right. Great. So um, also the other thing when we think about constipation, because this will slow down the peristalsis of the GI system, we want to think about um, if this patient has a paralytic ileus, a condition where the intestines are paralyzed, this is a contraindication. We will not give um, these opioid analgesics for this patient because it's already going to slow down their GI motility. If their intestines are paralyzed, um, then this would be creating a greater issue potentially. And you may be wondering, how does a patient's intestines get paralyzed? Well, uh, it could be due to anesthesia because that's one of the, uh, an adverse side effect from anesthesia. So that's why when your patient is a post-surgical patient and we listen or we auscultate for bowel sounds, we get excited when they say, oh, I've got a little bit of gas. I have flatulence. That means that their GI system is starting to work again. Okay, so that's a, a big kind of thing, paralytic ileus. Let me just put that in the chat just in case you see it. Paralytic. Okay. Okay. So paralytic ileus, okay? Um, so addiction may occur with long-term use. So if you get a question and it says the patient is taking one of these opioids, one of the questions we're gonna ask, of course, we're gonna assess the pain. We wanna know how long has the patient been taking this medication? That's gonna be an important question for us to understand just to see if there's any uh, potential for addiction or maybe this patient is already addicted. And again, take this food, uh, take this medication with food to prevent nausea. Now, hydromorphone is many more times stronger than morphine, and I looked it up to double check, and according to my research, it said it's maybe two to ten times stronger than morphine, so that's pretty, pretty strong, okay, very strong, um, and codeine is used as a cough suppressant. That's why now they're kind of controlling cough medicines because unfortunately that's one of the things that uh, young people are doing. They're getting these cough medications and they're drinking them in order to feel uh, high. So that's something else as a safety issue. Um, meropyridine decreases intracranial pressure, but so do but do not give for ICP 
or increased intracranial pressure. The medication for pa patients that have intracranial pressure issues is going to be mannitol, and we're going to get to that, but I'll put that in the chat just in case, mannitol. Okay. All right, so uh, another uh, safety point uh, is do not give oxycodone to patients that are allergic to acetaminophen because guess what? There's acetaminophen in that medication, okay? Any questions on this page? Okay, awesome. I feel like I skipped a page for some reason. Oh no, I think this did not print out well. This did not scan well. I was wondering why I didn't have a page there. Okay. Um, oh no, I wonder if my other one came out like that. Okay, so I'm missing page 96. I thought when I scanned it, I made sure it was a two-sided document. So, all right, I'll go over the ones that we have here and then I will um, figure out how I can get it to you. Maybe I can fix it on the break. Okay, so any questions on analgesics? No. No. Dean, I had a question. Um, it was in reference to chain of command. Yes. Uh, when you have, because I have seen a question before, when there was a nurse who, I think she was in like the medication room and she had a syringe in her arm, so she was taking some medication. Who do you report that to? Do you call the police first or would you go and tell like, say your charge nurse? Yeah, you would tell your charge nurse. You would. Okay. <laughs> so where did you see this question? That's an interesting one. I forgot. I was taking a test and I cannot remember exactly, but the choices were like, call the police. I can't remember what, I want to say it was a practice test. It was like, call the police or isolate the nurse, take the syringe or let the chain, uh, the charge nurse, nurse know. And I got it wrong because initially I was like, well, isolate her. You don't want her to leave that room. <laughs> but I, it makes sense now to report it to, of course, the charge nurse. Yes, always report, never confront someone because you never know how they're going to respond because now you kept, you caught her in the act of, you know, basically shooting up drugs mm -hmm. and she could attack you. So, That's yeah. And so your safety is going to be important as well. I mean, a lot of things can go badly if you confront someone when with if, without the appropriate support. And as the bedside nurse, that's not our job to confront, but it's our job to report anything that is a violation of, you know, policy procedure or is a safety issue. OK, well, wow, that's a pretty good question. OK, um, but yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for asking it. Okay, I'm kind of sad that this did not come out well. All right, so let me see. Um, what I'll, I'll put into the chat the medications that uh, did not show up, and then I'll have to, um, I'll probably uh, rescan it and send out again to you all. Um, I really regret that that did not come out good. Let me just see something. If my other one, okay, I'll just have to check later to see if my other one, because I think I probably did not check on the second document to make sure that it was two sides. All right, the next medication that I'm going to put into the chat that we will discuss, diphenhydramine, okay, is your diphenhydramine. Does anybody have any idea what that medication is? Let me see if I have. Benadryl? It is Benadryl. Okay, great. Okay. Um, it is Benadryl. What do we use Benadryl for? Allergic reaction. Go ahead. Okay, yes, for I heard some allergic reaction. So yes, absolutely. Okay. Oh, uh, okay going to, I'm just going to pull this up. So great. Thank you, Miriam. So um, I think I'll just push through and I'll make sure you all get this uh, later. But if you're watching the video, we should, you're still going to get everything. All right. So allergic uh, medications is what we're talking about now. So diphenhydramine is an antihistamine. It is also a sedative. Whenever a medication is a sedative, the first thing that I think of, okay, my patient better not be doing anything that requires mental alertness. They better not 
not be driving operating heavy machinery. They better not be in charge of small children uh, because they are not safe. They may uh, end up falling asleep, right? So that's a safety issue. That's something for you to look out for in your questions. If the patient is newly taking this and any medication that has a side effect of drowsiness, they need to know how they're going to respond and don't do anything that's going to re require mental alertness. So diphenhydramine can be given by mouth or it can be given IV or it can be given intramuscularly. It is also not only for the prevention of an allergic response, it is also for the prevention of nausea and vomiting. So the doctor will prescribe this medication to patients if they need to take a medication to which they are allergic to. So this sometimes, uh, and that kind of sounds weird, like why would I give a medication if they're allergic to it? Um, when If they're not severely allergic, we're not talking about if the patient has anaphylaxis. We're talking about maybe if they just have itching or if uh, which is pyritis or if they have urticaria which are hives so for example if a patient is uh, supposed to get blood or an IV contrast before CT and they have a mild allergic reaction we will administer this diphenhydramine beforehand to minimize their allergic reactions okay so but that doesn't mean that if we know the patient is going to have an anaphylactic um reaction that we would uh would give this and then say okay take the medication that you're allergic to and Miriam also says do not sign any official documents as well as operating machinery that's right anything that requires mental alertness we're not going to we're going to educate the patient don't do it Okay, don't do it. Okay, excellent. So the next medication, um, and that's diphenhydramine, that's your Benadryl. The next medications are PO medications, and these are allergy medications. And they are also listed, and I'm going to put them into the chat. Zeterizine. Okay, hopefully I'm spelling this correctly. Okay, cetrazine, here we go, and your loratadine. Okay, your loratadine. So these are also antihistamines. Now the thing with antihistamines, they are used to dry up secretions. So we have to think about uh, maybe a side effect the patient may report is that they have a dry mouth. And whenever a patient has a dry mouth, we tell them to use sugar-free candies um, and to you know drink water as long as it's not contraindicated. Why would I give a patient um, these antihistamines, maybe they have a common cold, maybe they have allergies. It could be due to rhinitis, which is a runny nose, right? And so the other thing besides, um, the other side effect besides dry mouth for these particular meds, these antihistamines, is possibly tachycardia. Okay, so um, we have to look out for that, teach the patient about that. And remember, the normal heart rate for adults is 60 to 100. Now, patients should take this, these medications, your cetrazine, your loratadine, on an empty stomach. And this can also, these medications can also cause drowsiness, but, and we do not give these medications to breastfeed women. Okay, we do not give to breastfeeding women. All right, the next class of medications are going to be corticosteroids, corticosteroids. And I think I might find them under respiratory medications. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. So here's a uh, let me see if I could search for it real quick. No, I don't have a uh, one just for that specifically. Okay, I don't have one just for that. Okay, so this is a respiratory one, so I'll just have this up. Um, actually, yes, this is perfect. Actually, so um, the fluticasone is an example of these corticosteroids. So we have. Um, uh, Beclomethazone, fluticasone, uh, 
mametazone and then triamiclinone. So all of the ones that end in O-N-E, these are corticosteroids and we're thinking, you know, they're nasal sprays. They are used for rhinitis, for chronic asthma. And the big thing with these is we have to think about that these oral corticosteroids can cause fungal infections of the mouth, oral candidiasis or thrush. We have to look out for hoarseness, epistaxis, and the nurse should teach each of the patients to rinse rinse their mouth after each use and seek regular peak flow monitoring. That's going to be really important to rinse the mouth afterwards. All right, any questions? Okay, we're gonna now jump then to antibiotics. Antibiotics. Antibiotics is gonna be the next class of medications that we think about. Why would a patient need antibiotics? Infection? Yes, infection, particularly bacterial infection bacterial infection. So very good. All right. So let's talk about uh, amino glycosides first. Okay. That's going to be the first one that we're talking about, amino glycosides. So when we think about amino glycosides, this is your streptomycin, azithromycin, gentamicin, vancomycin. Now, when we think about this, um, vancomycin is a macrolide, but it has the same side effects. Okay, so um, it's under aminoglycosides, but it's a little bit different. When, and so, so when we think about vancomycin, you need to be thinking about, I need to draw my vancomycin levels, right? And so whenever we're administering an antibiotic, it's going to be for a bacterial infection. If you have to get a culture and sensitivity, meaning you're going to draw some blood, maybe swab a wound to find out what bacteria is growing, you always want to get that culture first before you start antibiotic treatment. That's really important. Now, how do these amino glycosides work? Well, they are important to fight conditions like meningitis, infective endocarditis, septicemia, and septicemia is a disease where the bacteria is actually in the bloodstream. Um, and let me back up. Meningitis is an infection of the meninges of the, the nervous system. So the meninges of the brain and spinal cord, those are the layers. So the patient with meningitis can have a stiff neck, which is called nuchal rigidity. Uh, infective endocarditis is an infection of the inner layer of the heart. Septicemia is the blood of the bacteria in the blood. And then C. difficile, Clostridium difficile, is um, a condition of the gastrointestinal tract where the patient will have watery diarrhea and it smells very, very foul. Once you smell C. diff, you will know, okay? Now, if the patient is taking these amino glycosides, we have to look out for ototoxicity, which is damage to the ears, nephrotoxicity, which is damage to the kidneys. So with the patient may complain of ringing in the ears, dizziness, That's a, those are signs of ototoxicity. Nephro, we think okay with the kidneys. So the patient may not have uh, enough urine. Remember, 30 mLs of urine per hour is the standard for patients that are not on dialysis, okay? So for these antibiotics, these aminoglycosides, we might have to draw the peak and trough levels, peak and trough. And let me just put that into um, the chat. And I know that I'm going to be giving you a lot of information. I'm going to try to put these things in the chat because you may not realize you don't understand something until you're going back over your notes and like, oh my goodness. So if you have it written down, those resources, the videos that I showed you, they can definitely, they'll definitely have this information that you can look up or you can send me a text message and say, okay, I didn't understand this concept. Uh, can you just give me a quick text back? So I kind of uh, get a little bit of clarity, okay? But when we think about peak and trough, that is when is the medication high and when is the medication at its lowest inside of the patient's system, okay? 
So we want to draw the peak 30 minutes after giving the medication if it was given IV. We'll draw the peak one hour after if the root was PO. And it makes sense because we know IV medications, they act more rapidly in a patient. If it's through the PO route, that's going through the digestive system is going to take a little bit longer. Okay, draw the trough 30 minutes before the final dose. Okay, if the antidote for aminoglycosides is going to be calcium gluconate, calcium gluconate. Okay, and I'm just putting that in the chat. Okay, bear with me. My typing has, I'm trying to not have misspell words. Okay, amino glycosides is definitely not spelled. Okay, there we go. All right, uh, I'm going to jump now to penicillin. Okay, when we think penicillin, we're thinking penicillin, amoxicillin, uh, ampicillin. Okay, I'm going to use this as my visual aid. So, again, penicillin, the penicillin family. Not only penicillin, amoxicillin, and penicillin. How do they help? Well, the patient may be diagnosed with gonorrhea, pneumonia, urinary tract infection, skin infection, um, uh, ear infection, right? So all of these different kinds of infections, as, as also you can see others in the picture. So we have to get a really good history. Do not give, and we talk about history of allergies, do not give if any reaction has occurred in the past. This is safe for pregnant or breastfeeding women. So the first time the patient stays, uh, I'm sorry, the first time the patient takes penicillin, stay with them for at least 15 minutes. And that's actually a good practice, uh, especially if it's a medication that has a high allergy uh, possibility. You want to stay for the patient for the first 15 minutes. Just like if we were administering blood, we would stay with the patient for the first 15 minutes of that blood draw, uh, of that blood transfusion, because we are looking to see if they're having any allergic reaction. Who can tell me um, if what we would see if the patient was having an allergic reaction? Can we possibly see rash? Yes. Okay. You could see a rash, which is urticaria. Swelling. Okay. Yes. Swelling or um, edema. Okay. Mm -hmm. yes. Hives. Hives. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Urticaria is hives. Difficulty breathing. Yes, Miriam. That's right. Okay. Good. And then the itching, which is here, right us. Okay. And I just, I'm using these words in case you see them in a question. I don't want you to get the question wrong because you're like, I don't know what you to care it is. Right. And puritis, if I could spell it correctly, that would be good. All right, here we go. Puritis. Puritis. Okay, here we go. Okay, and so that's going to be your itching. Okay, so very good. All right, so um, so stay with the patient the first time for 15 minutes, the first time they received this penicillin. Epinephrine is the antidote for an allergic reaction. Okay, so epinephrine is the antidote. And PCN is penicillin. And when we say penicillin, we're talking about, uh, in this class, we're thinking penicillin, amoxicillin, and uh, ampicillin. So educate the patient. And this is for any antibiotic, please. Educate the patients to take the medication for the full prescribed length of time. Okay, that's going to be important. All right, that is your amoxicillin. Let's jump into Tetracyclines, tetracyclines. Okay, when we think about te tetracyclines, we're thinking about doxycycline, um, demacycline, minocycline. These medications, these tetracyclines can be used for UTIs. Okay. 
just want to make sure I'm sharing for UTIs, for pneumonia, for gonorrhea, syphilis. And this medication may be given if the patient is allergic to penicillin. Okay, so this medication, these tetracyclines can cause phototoxicity, nephrotoxicity, and hepatotoxicity. Okay, so when we think about phototoxicity, what is phototoxicity? Reacting to sunlight. Yes, excellent. Okay, very good. Okay, and it's a, like a photosensitivity. Okay, that's good. I'm glad that you're here, Monica. All right, so we have to look out for that. So I've seen questions where, okay, my patient teaching is, please wear your sunscreen, wear long sleeves, wear a sun hat to protect your skin from the sun. Okay, again, that's doxycycline, um, demacycline, aminocycline. We look out for phototoxicity, nephrotoxicity, again, damage to the kidneys. Hepatotoxicity is going to be damage to the liver. We want the patient to stay out of direct sunlight, monitor their liver enzymes. What are the liver enzymes? Well, they could be abbreviated as ALT, AST, those are your liver enzymes. And we want to monitor their kidney function. We want to monitor their lab values and urine output. Whenever kidney function is a, is a concern, we're looking at urine. And remember, it's 30 mLs of urine per hour, okay, in a patient that is not uh, on dialysis, all right? Um, and with these tetracyclines, we do not give if the patient is pregnant or breastfeeding. Do not give with cow's milk. Do not give to children under eight years old. It will cause their teeth to turn black. Give this medication with a straw because it can stain the teeth and avoid giving this medication with Lasix. Okay, that's your tetracyclines. Okay, we're gonna jump to cephalosporins and we're still talking about antibiotics. I know some of you are uh, just coming in or maybe coming back in, but the cephalosporins, we think uh, cepha cephazolin or your cephalexin. Okay, so when we think about cephalosporins, it's a class of antibiotics that can be given for UTIs, pneumonia, gonorrhea. Do not give if the patient is allergic to penicillin. Okay, side effects for cephalosporins. Okay, and so the acronym for the side effects for cephalosporins is HARI. Okay, HARI. And so H stands for hyperglycemic. A stands for anaphylactic. Okay. Oh, sorry, that's not typed the best, but I think you get what it is. The I stands for insufficient platelets. Sufficient platelets, okay. And the R is for renal problems. Again, the acronym is HARI, and I'm putting it into the chat. And the Y is standing for uh, yellow poop, okay? Yellow poop, which is diarrhea, okay? Uh, yellow poop, okay? Yellow poop. And so why are these important? Because we have to think about these are things that we have to tell the patient. If you're taking cephalosporins, you might have yellow poop. You might have some diarrhea, okay? Um, or if you see that you are bleeding because thrombocytopenia, which is insufficient platelets, is a side effect that you need to report that to the provider, okay? So that's why these side effects are important. So I always want you to think about it uh, in that perspective because that's how you'll be able to get test questions correctly and that's how you'll develop your critical thinking as well. All right, the last medication and let me just show the other uh, cephalosporin. This is another uh, visual aid and so you have access to these so you can definitely go back and look at these. Um, I know we're giving you a lot of information in a short amount of time but you can go back and you can look at these to really absorb it to read all of the things that are in the fine print. So this is the second pictorial for cephalosporin. Okay, right now we're talking about antibiotics. And the next one is ciprofloxacin. 
So ciproflaxin, this is a definitely one to know for NCLEX. Uh, it's affectionately called cipro, right? So this ciproflaxin is used for bacterial infections, respiratory anthrax, urinary tract infections. Side effects, we have to look out for photosensitivity. We also have to look out for GI distress in terms of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. And with this medication, they can actually show a false positive on a urine drug screen when we're testing for opiates. So that's an important uh, point uh, to note to teach the patient because if they do have to take a drug screen, they just need to have a note from the doctor saying, okay, I'm taking ciproflaxin for my you know, bacterial infection. Okay, well, they don't have to give that level of detail, but just in case you see it as a scenario, you understand, you know, how it how it works. In children, there is a concern because it may uh, damage uh, their their bones. Okay, and so this says avoided in children under 18 years old. Okay, avoided in children under 18 years old. Ciproflaxin. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so those of you who have uh, the sheet, uh, we are using Remar. I did not make it up. I can't take credit for it. We're going to go to anticoagulants, but I'm going to stick with the visual aids because I think it might be helpful for those that are visual learners. And so we're going to be talking about anticoagulants. I'm going to start with heparin. Okay, so heparin. Heparin is a medication that is an anticoagulant. Anti is against, coagulant is the blood clotting. And so it's used for patients that we are afraid that they may have clots. So this could be in a patient that is a post-surgical patient. It could be used in a patient that is post-stroke, CVA. But right now we're talking about heparin. The onset of heparin is less than one hour. And this is a short-term medication that can be delivered either IV intravenously or subcutaneously. If heparin is given IV, and heparin in, in general is a two nurse check. If heparin is given IV, we closely monitor the patient's platelets. That's going to be really important. Closely monitor the patient's platelets. We also want to carefully monitor the IV site, looking out for signs of bleeding. And whenever a patient is on anticoagulants, we want to look out for signs of bleeding. The patient will be on bleeding precautions. So let me pause for a second and ask you all, what's bleeding precautions? No injuries. Okay. Yes, no injuries, no contact sports. We tell them to use a soft bristle toothbrush. Um, we also tell them to look out for nosebleeds, which is epistaxis. Look out for blood in their urine, blood in their stools, easily bruising. So all of these things, they should not use a straight edge razor. If they must shave, they must use an electric razor. So absolutely, okay. Miriam, I see you, you said no sports, right? No contact sports. Okay, excellent. So with uh, heparin, if it's subcutaneous, we want to rotate the sites two inches away from the umbilicus, which is the belly button. Two inches away from the belly button, we're going to rotate the sites. We're going to look out for the labs, okay? The labs are going to be PTT, right? And that says it in this pictorial. We're going to look out for the labs. We also need to know that the antidote for heparin is protamine sulfate, protamine sulfate. All right. So is it safe for pregnancy? Yes, it is. This medication, will it break down a clot? No, it won't. It is a preventatory, uh, preventive measure. Okay. And one of the co complications or side effects we could expect to see is heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Thrombocytopenia means low platelets. Heparin-induced thrombocytopenia means that we have low platelets because heparin was given. Now, this is your heparin. Now, the heparin is given in the hospital setting. 
And while the patient is getting um, this heparin, and we know that they have to go home on an anticoagulant, you may see them also receiving warfarin, which is an oral medication. So they can receive both at the same time. The reason why they would receive both is because we're waiting for the warfarin to get to a therapeutic level because the patient will be able to go home on warfarin. So warfarin takes four to 10 days to really kick in. This is a long-term medication that's given PO, meaning by mouth. And we have to monitor the INR or the PT, okay? The INR or the PT. The antidote for warfarin is vitamin K. The antidote for warfarin is vitamin K. Do not give to a pregnant patient. Do not give warfarin to a pregnant patient. And um, this warfarin will not break down a clot. It is not a clot buster or thrombolytic. So it's a, a preventative measure again. And the side effect to look out for is going to be Coumadin-induced necrosis. Now, when we think about our anticoagulants, specifically our warfarin and Coumadin, that's what we've just been talking about, be careful because some herbal medications can interfere with your anticoagulants, like your ginkgo, like your garlic. Okay, anything pretty much that starts with a G can interfere with uh, your patients and their uh, anticoagulation medication. It can also cause increased risk for bleeding. Tell patients to stop taking this medication, heparin and warfarin, two weeks before surgery. Frequent blood draws will be needed during the beginning of the treatment because we're seeing if the, at a therapeutic level, we're checking the patient's um, uh, platelet level. Okay. All right. The next medication that we're going to talk about is anoxaparin. Anoxaparin is a low, low molecular weight heparin, okay? And so it will be given to prevent DVT or deep vein thrombosis. It is going to be given subcutaneously or IV. IV is really less common. Most of the times it's given as a subcutaneous injection. The syringe already comes pre-filled and ready to go. The assessment, well, this medication, we have to look at it as we should look at all medications, but this one is in particular, we have to make sure that it is clear with no particles or discoloration before we inject it. Okay, we also want to monitor for signs of bleeding. Again, this medication, it comes in a clear glass syringe and the medication itself should be clear with no particles or discoloration before we inject it. And then we also have to monitor for signs signs of bleeding. Do not give. So these are your contraindications for anoxaparin. Do not give if the patient has a history of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Remember, thrombocytes are platelets. Thrombocytopenia is low platelets. Heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is low platelets due to heparin therapy. Okay. Patients should stop taking anoxaparin 24 hours before surgery, okay? And all of these medications that the patient has to stop taking before surgery, it's to reduce their risk of bleeding, okay? It's to reduce their risk of bleeding. Do not give anoxaparin with other blood thinners. And again, anoxaparin is a low molecular weight heparin. And um, the good thing that's uh, about anoxaparin, it's a once daily injection. We don't have to particularly closely monitor the labs and this can be taken as an outpatient therapy. So they don't have to be in the hospital setting to take this medication. I'm gonna pause for a second while I'm going to the next topic and see if there's any questions. All right, if you have to take a break, definitely take a break. I'm actually not going to stop right now. I'm going to keep going because we have many, um, many medications and I have a session after this. So I want to make sure that I cover uh, everything that I wanted to cover. So there's a lot of medication. So we're going to continue. Uh, I'm now going to go into anticonvulsants or anti-epileptic 
uh, medications and I don't see any questions in the chat, so I'm going to keep going. All right, so when we think about anticonvulsants, um, I'm thinking phenobarbital, I'm thinking phenoytin, I'm thinking valproic acid, I'm thinking gabapentin. Okay, and let me kind of, maybe you can see this a little bit better. Kind of, oops, okay. Okay, because it might be a little small. Okay, so again, anticonvulsants, phenobarbital, phenoytin, valproic acid, gabapentin. So let's talk about phenobarbital first. So phenobarbital decreases blood pressure and respirations. Vitamin D supplement may be needed with phenobarbital. Phenoytin, do not give with food, do not take with oral birth control pills. Phenoytin is one of those medications that we must also carefully monitor and look out for toxicity. Valproic acid, it's a hepatotoxic agent, meaning it could damage the liver, and we have to watch out for abdominal cramping, and it may cause suicidal thoughts. Valproic acid, hepatotoxic agent, it may damage the liver. We have to watch out for abdominal cramping. It may cause suicidal thoughts. Gabapentin, this may cause memory problems. Do not administer with antacids will help with the symptoms of restless leg syndrome. Now, I know we're talking about anticonvulsants, but gabapentin has many other uh, reasons why it's given, many other therapeutic outcomes. You may recognize it from working with your diabetic patients who have peripheral neuropathy. Gabapentin is also considered now a control substance because of the uh, abuse that's been taking place. So when you go to your medication cart, this is going to be a medication that is in the double lock box and you have to count when you do your narcotics count. So that is gabapentin. Now, when we think about our uh, anticonvulsants, uh, we want to think that, okay, there is a potential for toxicity. We also may think that, okay, this, these medications can cause drowsiness. They should not be taken with antacids because antacids will decrease the absorption. We can also uh, have to think that these anticonvulsants can elevate blood glucose levels. So blood glucose monitoring may be something the nurse has to do. Now, these medications may also change the urine to a light rust color, but this is not clinically significant, but that's an important point to teach the patient so they're not freaking out when they say, oh my goodness, my urine is rust colored. So the patient... Uh, may still have a seizure, but this decreases their chances of having seizures. Now, patients that do have seizures, they should be op they should be wearing a medical uh, alert bracelet. They should not be driving. They should not be doing anything that will put them in danger. And if they have, you know, a seizure, so operating heavy machinery. Um, if uh, this was my babysitter, I would probably get a different babysitter, just because you know we don't know when they can actually have a seizure. Okay, um, and do not give any of these medications, phenobarbital, phenoytin, valproic acid, or gabapentin before the patient has electroconvulsive therapy. Okay, if your patient is on any of these anti epileptic or anti convulsant medications, same thing, do initiate seizure precautions. Who can tell me what seizure precautions are? Anyone? Um, seizure precaution, you have to loosen their tight, if they have like any tight clothing, you have to loosen it. Make sure where they are, the environment is free from rolling to anything that will injure them. And um, um, time the the time of the, um, keep a time of the time, um, time sheet of how it happened, the time limit and everything. 
Yes. Okay. Describe what's happening with the patient. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. So we will pad the side rails. I know that sometimes that's kind of controversial, but we'll pad the side rails. There'll be a fall mat on the floor. Of course, the bed is at the lowest possible level, low stimuli, low noise, low light, um, not by the nurse's station. So all of those things that go along with your patient on seizure precautions. Okay. Excellent. All right. Thank you, Amonico. That was great. Okay. Keep the area clear of furniture that can hurt them. And yes, yes, yes. If your patient is having a seizure, our primary concern is their airway. Turn them on their left side. Okay. Great, great, great. All right. I'm going to, I'm sharing with you uh, on your screen, uh, you should see these medication antidotes. Okay. Medication antidotes. This is the list that I was searching for before. And uh, let me try to put it into the chat. Um, So I can, so you can have this list. Okay, so you should have it now in the chat. These are your medication antidotes. I'm not going to read the, all of them for you because we already talked about some of them actually, but I'll just mention a few. The medication is magnesium sulfate. The antidote is uh, calcium gluconate. The medication is magnesium sulfate. The antidote is calcium gluconate. For the medication, acetaminophen. We have N-acetylcysteine is the antidote. For insulin, the antidote is glucagon. Morphine is naloxone. And for other opioids, naloxone. And for high potassium, we can give insulin via IV. A sodium polycystyrene sulfonate. For benzodiazepines, the antidote is flu, uh, flumenazil. Um, and then for a met methotrexate, the antidote is leucorvorin. Leucorvorin. Okay. All right. Excellent. Okay. Let's now jump into antineoplastics. Antineoplastics. All right. Antineoplastics. Neoplastics are your cancer medications. We're thinking chemotherapy. Okay. And I will tell you, as I'm trying to get this uh, to go back, um, when we think about chemotherapy, chemotherapy is used for treating of cancer. When we think about, here we go. When we think about a patient that is on cancer medications, um, what I'm thinking is, okay, they may lose their hair. They may lose their hair and we want to get them to um, choose maybe their wig before they start chemotherapy, right? Before they start chemotherapy, uh, if so it can closely match their natural style. So when we think about anti-neoplastics, again, this is your chemotherapy medications. We're talking about cisplatin, cyclophosphamide, methotrexate, and tamoxifen. Okay, so let me type those into the chat as I talk about them. So when we think about cisplatin, okay, cisplatin may cause tinnitus, blurry vision, and fever. And so we have to look out for, again, tinnitus, blurry vision, and fever. Okay, so. Okay, and then we also want to look out for electrolyte imbalances when the patient is taking cisplatin. So we're looking out for low levels of potassium, calcium, magnesium, and phosphorus. So you may see the words hypo kalemia, low potassium, hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia, low magnesium, and hypophosphatemia, low phosphorus, okay, low phosphorus. The next um, antineoplastic is going to be cyclophosphamide. The patient must rinse their mouth to prevent stomatitis. This medication may cause sterility. So that's something that we have to educate the patients on. 
Okay, the next anti-neoplastic medication is methotrexate. When I think about methotrexate, um, the patient may have thrombocytopenia. Now we talked about thrombocytopenia before. Thrombocytes are platelets. Thrombocytopenia is low platelet count. So methotrexate may cause the patient to have low uh, platelets. It may also cause toxicity. And the antidote for methotrexate is leucovorin. Okay, so let me put that in there. Leucovorin is the antidote for methotrexate. The next antineoplastic cancer medication is tamoxifen. Okay, when we think about tamoxifen, it, uh, it does affect women. It can cause hot flashes, irregular menstruation, and vaginal bleeding and discharge. Again, tamoxifen affects women by creating hot flashes, irregular menstruation, vaginal bleeding, and discharge. Now, for any of these antineoplastics that we're talking about, um, let me just see here. Any of these anti-neoplastics, uh, I'll just stick with this pictorial. Don't assign a nurse that is pregnant or breastfeeding to these patients. And patients that are taking this, they need to increase their fluids to two to three liters per day. Chemotherapy is excreted through the urine. So if a patient is post-chemo, they must close the toilet and flush twice. If the toilet is one that doesn't have a lid, they should put a towel over it and flush twice. Okay, that's really important. Okay, patients that are getting uh, antineoplastics or chemotherapy, they should avoid vaccinations. We must monitor their daily weight. We also have to understand that these antineoplastics can cause an increase in the uric acid. So we have to monitor the uric acid levels. And we also will use bleeding precautions while the patient is taking antineoplastics because sometimes when patients are taking antineoplastics, they may be given blood thinners, okay? So sometimes, again, when the patient is taking antineoplastics, they may be given blood thinners. So we have to use our bleeding precautions. Chemotherapy medications require special handling. They are special gloves. Sometimes we even have to double glove. We have to wear a gown, eye protection, uh, mask, uh, face shield when we are handling these medications because they are very dangerous. They're considered cytotoxic. Chemotherapy can cause future birth defects. So again, no pregnant or breastfeeding nurses should care for this patient. Gla gown, gloves, face protection if administering a liquid. One pair of gloves, special gloves should be worn. They're uh, high nitrile gloves that really don't, they're not very porous. There are special gloves for chemotherapy. Now, if the patient is receiving chemotherapy via an IV, it is going to be a central line and we have to look out for extravasation. Extravasation, and let me just put this into... Extravasation is when the medication actually gets outside of the IV and it damages the skin surrounding. Uh, and it you can tell when we see extravasation. And let me just pause for a second to show you what extravasation looks like just in case, okay, just in case. Um, mm, okay, this picture will have to do. All right, so here's an example of extravasation, okay? This arm right here, this forearm looks like there was uh, some damage done. Now, if you have those strong kind of toxic medications, um, extravasation can happen if, again, the IV site or the central line goes bad and the patient's surrounding tissues can be damaged, okay? So that's what we have to look out for. So if your patient has extravasation at the at the IV site, in this case for chemo, they're going to have a central line where the first priority is to stop the infusion, keep the IV catheter in place. Second priority is notify the primary health care provider, okay? Notify the primary health care provider. All right. 
we are, I'm going to pause for a second to see if there's any questions before we go to our next uh, set of meds. All right, we're going into anti-Parkinson's. When we think about Parkinson's disease, let me just quickly show you what a Parkinson's patient looks like. Um, when they think Parkinson's, think Michael J. Fox, think mass-like facies, think shuffling gait, um, think muscle rigidity, cogwheel rigidity, right? So this is your Parkinson's patient. They have uncontrollable drool. Uh, it's a progressive chronic condition. Okay, so that was just a quick uh, look of what your Parkinson patient looks like. So let's talk about the medication that this Parkinson's patient will have. Okay, so the ones that I want to uh, mention, okay, the ones that I want to mention are going to be benztropine, carbidopa, levodopa, and then selegaline. Okay, so let's talk about uh, benztropine first. So this medication is an anticholinergic, that's how it works. And we don't want to administer with antihistamines, okay? So we don't want to administer with antihistamines. It may cause a fever and it may help with the extra pyrimidal symptoms, those extra movements that's caused by psychiatric medication. So this is your benztropine. Okay, your benztropine. Okay, and the next medication is your carbidopa, levodopa. I don't think I have um, a pictorial for that one. So, but I'll show this one. So carbidopa, levodopa increases the dopamine. And we know with our Parkinson's patients, they actually have low levels of dopamine. So this is going to help the patient, right, that has Parkinson's. Now, with your patient taking carbidopa, levodopa, they need to eat a low-protein diet as protein interferes with this medication. I'll say that again. If your patient is on carbidopa, levodopa, they need to eat a low-protein diet as protein interferes with this medication, okay? So this can cause, this medication, carbidopa, levodopa, can cause false positive ketones in the urine, false positive ketones in the urine, and it can cause hemolytic anemia. When you think heme, think blood, anemia, think low blood cells. So lytic is breaking down. So, um, red blood cells can be broken down, causing the patient to become anemic, okay? The next medication for Parkinson's disease, I'm going to put it into the chat, is selegaline, okay? Selegaline, so this is an MAOI, okay? So let me go to MAOIs because MAOIs actually have very specific things that go with them, okay? MAOIs. So MAOIs, uh, really important, the dietary restrictions that go with MAOIs. If the patient has these, uh, these kinds of foods uh, that are high in tyramine, they can have a hypertensive crisis, okay? So this is important, and that is your cell, uh, cell egaline. I put the medication in the chat. So with this MAOI, and we're talking about anti-Parkinson's medications right now, avoid food high in tyramine. The patient may uh, experience sexual dysfunction, and the patient should not stop taking this medication abruptly, okay? When we think about uh, MAOIs, we have to educate the patient to stay away from aged foods like cheese, like wine, preserves meats, no salami, no chocolate either, okay? That's going to be important. And MAOIs could also be given for mental health as well, okay? So side effects of anti-Parkinson medication, altered vital signs, avoid sudden movements, right? They can have blurry vision, constipation, confusion, dry mouth, and dizziness. We have to teach the patient to monitor for improvement of their Parkinson's uh, symptoms. And again, do not stop taking this medication abruptly. All right, I'm gonna pause for questions as we're jumping into our cardiac, cardiovascular medications. Um, you said that the carbidopa, levodopa um, could result in a false positive what? I 
didn't get oh um, yes false positive ketones in their urine okay got it thank you okay you're welcome okay okay let's see let's see Okay, is this the medication that I want to focus on? Let me see. Okay, let me just double check. Okay, um, no, okay. All right, I'm going to go back. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to this because I do have this to share. So we're on cardiac medications. So when we think about cardiac medications, these antihypotensive medications actually raise the blood pressure. So we're thinking about dopamine, epinephrine, uh, phenep phenylephrine, and norepinephrine. So dopamine is a quick onset, right? Five minutes. Epinephrine is immediate, okay, as well as phenethylephrine. And then norepinephrine, the onset is 15 to 20 minutes. Why will we use dopamine? Well, for heart failure patients, and it will help increase the urine output in patients who have renal failure. Renal failure is kidney failure. So for epinephrine, we use it, and y'all may know, right, for anaphylactic shock or cardiac arrest. Your phenylephrine will be used if the patient is in vasodilatory shock. Vaso, think blood vessels. Your veins and arteries are blood vessels. Dilatory means that they're open, they're dilated, and the patient is in shock, okay? Um, and then hemorrhagic shock means that the patient is bleeding. And it will not raise the pressure. Uh, I'm sorry, it will raise the blood pressure, but not the patient's heart rate. Okay, so that is your uh, phenylephrine. Norepinephrine can be given for patients that are in septic shock. And we talked about septicemia before, that is bacteria in the bloodstream. Okay, and it can cause modeling. Okay, let me just pause for a second to show you modeling. Modeling tells us that the patient has um, a circulatory compromise, okay, modeling. Okay, so let's real quick show you modeling. So these are pictures of what modeling looks like, okay? That's not a reassuring sign in your patient in case you see uh, modeling, okay? All right. Um, okay. All right, let's go... Uh, Hypertensive medications. Okay, I'm going to go back to the pictorials for a second. Um, so we'll talk about our ACE inhibitors. Those are the ones that end in pril. Okay, those are the ones that end in pril, lisinopril, captopril, elanopril. So ACE inhibitors end in pril. These medications work by blocking the enzyme that converts angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. So ACE inhibitors, they block the enzyme that works to convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Okay, angiotensin 2 is important because it helps to secrete additional blood pressure elevating hormone uh, called aldosterone. Okay, so but the ACE inhibitor blocks that from happening. The thing that's important, um, you know, besides all the other stuff that's important, uh, we have to avoid the use of these in African Americans or be wary of the use of these ACE inhibitors in African Americans because of the increased risk of angioedema. Angioedema is going to be the swelling of the blood vessels. Now, it's so serious that it can actually swell, cause their airways to swell shut, okay? So in your patient that is African-American, they have a dry hacking cough that seems to be getting worse. This could be a sign of angioedema. Okay, if your patient has a history of angioedema or kidney disease or renal impairment, do not give or question the order for an ACE inhibitor. Do not give ACE inhibitors to pregnant patients and look out for potassium because ACE inhibitors can increase potassium levels. Okay, can increase potassium levels. 
Okay. All right. We're going to jump to our sartans, which are ARBs. And I think I have, uh, yep, here we go. Our sartans. So these are angiotensin receptor blockers, the ARBs. So these are your sartans. So you have low sartan, val sartan. So they block the effects of angiotensin 2 at the receptor sites. ARBs may raise the potassium levels. So they, we should also teach the patient to take it at bedtime to better control their blood pressure, and they should avoid grapefruit juice when they're taking low sartan. So if you see a question and it says, oh, the patient is on low sartan, what should they take the medication with? Not grapefruit juice. Take it with a glass of water, okay? Take it with a glass of water. Okay, now we're going to jump to calcium channel blockers. Calcium channel blockers. When we think calcium channel blockers, we're thinking amylodipine, nifedipine, verapamil, dialtazem. Nifedipine is a medication that you probably, if you've taken mother baby, or maybe if you had a baby, you heard about it. Nifedipine can be used also for gestational hypertension. Okay, so um, patients that have high blood pressure during pregnancy, okay, nifedipine. So again, calcium channel blockers, amylodipine, nifedipine, verapamil, and diltazem. So these medications stop calcium from entering the myocardium, which is the thick muscular layer of the heart, and it promotes vasodilation. Dilation means the opening of the, those vessels. Now, nifedipine ER, ER means extended release and is safe to give during pregnancy, but we will not give calcium channel blockers to patients that have a heart block, and we will also not give this medication with grapefruit juice. So nifedipine ER, extended release, is safe for your pregnant patients. We won't give calcium channel blockers to patients with heart block and we will not give with grapefruit juice, okay? All right, the next uh, medications the class that I want to talk about is your diuretics, particularly your thiazide diuretics, okay? Um, diuretic medications, your thiazide diuretics. Okay, I don't have one for the ones that we're going to talk about, but I'll show this one. All right, so drugs that end in thiazide are the thiazide diuretics, okay? So hydrochlorothiazide or chlorothiazide. So hydrochlorothiazide or chlorothiazide are those medications that we're discussing now under thiazide diuretics. Diuretics work by increasing the release of sodium and potassium. So we have to look out for hypo kalemia, okay, as well as hyponatremia. So, but the potassium is going to be more important, right, because we're thinking that low potassium or high potassium can affect the patient's cardiac rhythm. So a value that you must know is 3.5 to 5.0. That is potassium's normal range in the body, 3.5 to 5.0. Now, when this patient is taking a diuretic, just diuretics in general, we think that, okay, they're going to be diuresing or releasing their extra fluid through urine. So we give this medication in the morning, not at night. Make sure that we toilet the patient every two hours because if not, this patient is a fall risk. All of those things, make sure that the bath, the path to the bathroom, to the toilet is well lit. Uh, all of those things uh, need to be followed. Now, when your patient is on thiazide diuretics, we won't give this to patients who have a sulfa allergy. Thiazide diuretics can cause photosensitivity. And again, administer in the morning to prevent nocturia. Nocturia is nighttime urination. So other thing that's important about thiazide diuretics, it decreases the effectiveness of anti-diabetic medications. So I must carefully monitor my, my patient's blood sugar. Avoid giving thiazide diuretics with lithium because we are afraid of lithium toxicity. 
okay, will be afraid of lithium toxicity. Since we're talking about diuretics, let's just mention our loop diuretics, furosemide, aka Lasix. For NCLEX, you should know furosemide. So all of the things that were mentioned about the thiazide uh, pretty much apply. And again, this is used for our patients that have edema or swelling. This patient should also be on I's and O's intake and output. We should also have this patient on daily weight. Okay, first thing in the morning after they empty their bladder is going to be the best time to take daily weight. Okay, we're looking out again for our potassium. Now, if the patient uh, has issues with potassium, like we need to save potassium, they may be placed on a potassium sparing diuretic, particularly spironolactone. Okay, so now with this, we have to, of course, monitor the patient's potassium levels. Spironolactone, again, is a potassium sparing diuretic. Okay, they will diurese, release that extra fluid that's causing them to have edema. But again, we have to carefully monitor the patient's potassium levels. We also have to look out for headache, diarrhea, electrolyte imbalance, impotence, and gynecomastia, which is breast development in males. And in females, we also may have to look out for irregular menstrual cycle. Okay, all right. Now we're going to uh, an important one. This is like my favorite one to harp on, I think, is digoxin. So let me pause and ask somebody to tell me everything they know or anything they know about digoxin. It needs to monitor apical pulse before giving digoxin. It needs to be, if it's less than 60, you don't give it. I know that. And it's used to strengthen the heart muscle. Okay, absolutely. Absolutely. So when I think about this, um, when I think digoxin, I think apical pulse, I think left midclavicular line fifth intercostal space. Those are the landmarks for uh, monitoring the apical pulse. And again, yes, if it's less than 60, we hold the digoxin and immediately notify the provider because it's a cardiac glycoside and it will uh, help the heart to beat more forcefully so it will beat less, okay? And so this will help increase the patient's blood pressure um, help with the blood pressure and tissue perfusion, okay? So we want to monitor for digoxin toxicity. A therapeutic level is between one and two. This is one that we definitely have to monitor. If the digoxin level is greater than two, we're thinking, okay, digoxin toxicity. And what are the signs and symptoms? What are the clinical cues? How do we know the patient has digoxin toxicity? Well, if the patient says that they have nausea, and they're taking digoxin, don't say, oh, we'll just go ahead and take it with food. No, recognize this is digoxin toxicity. The patient may also have vomiting, abdominal pain. They may have visual disturbances like green, yellow halos or spots. Um, and so again, this is, you know, these are all signs of digoxin toxicity. We also have to monitor the potassium levels. Low potassium level can increase the risk of digoxin toxicity. So potassium is like super duper important, right? If you haven't learned anything in this time together, potassium is super important in so many ways. Okay. If the patient becomes toxic, we will give activated charcoal or the antidote is also digoxin immune fab. Okay. Digoxin immune fab. That is the antidote. Okay. All right. Any questions? All right. We're going to jump into nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin. All right, nitroglycerin is a vasodilator given to reduce the preload and the afterload of the heart, okay? So it will lower the blood pressure and increases the oxygenation of the tissues. Now, 
nitroglycerin, you all know the rule. If the patient is having chest pain or angina, they'll immediately take their nitroglycerin sublingual under the tongue. And then for 15 minutes, three doses. But as soon as they take that first dose, they must call 911. Nitroglycerin should be kept in a dark container in a cool place. Every six months, it must be changed out. Sublingual nitroglycerin is under the tongue. There's also the spray. There's also a patch that should not be placed on a hair area or on the breasts. The, the transdermal patch must be in place for 10 to 12 hours taken off at night. And if it's a home setting, take off the patch, close the medication patch uh, with the medication inside. And of course, as nurses, we're wearing gloves and we will put it into a closed trash receptacle so small children and animals can't get to it. Now, if your patient is taking nitroglycerin, do not take with sildenafil. okay? This is your little blue pill, okay? Because the patient can have severe hypotension. So sildenafil is not uh, recommended. It is actually contraindicated to be taken with nitroglycerin, okay? Um, do not eat or drink anything when the patient is, should not eat or drink anything when taking sublingual nitroglycerin. And if we're using that nitroglycerin patch, don't put it over a pacemaker and remove the patch before the patient goes uh, to for an MRI, okay? If the, the doctor orders nitroglycerin IV, always put it on an infusion pump always put it on an infusion pump, okay? All right, all right, all right. Okay, I mentioned those kind of diuretics. I'm now gonna jump into the GI system. Any questions so far? Okay, let's go to gastro, gastrointestinal medications. All right, so... The first medication, we're thinking GI, we're talking about medications that stop nausea and vomiting. So ondesetron is one, promethazine and meclizine. So let me put these. So these are our anti-nausea um, and vomiting medications. Ondesetron. Promethazine and then meclizine. And again, these medications are all fair game uh, for NCLEX, for your pharmacology HESI, your pharmacology final. These are all um, you know, frequently seen administered medications. So let's talk about on Dancitron first, also known as Zofran. We will give 30 minutes before chemo or one hour before radiation because we know that those kinds of treatments cause the patient to be nauseous. These medications uh, on, on Dancitron can cause a headache. Do not give oral tablets to patients with phenylketonuria because they contain aspartame and this can form into phenylalanine. Okay, so on Desitron, do not give oral tablets to patients that have uh, PKU, basically, uh, phenylketonuria, because they contain aspartamine, uh, which forms phenylaniline. Okay, all right. And so here we have our pictorial. The next one is promethazine. I don't know. Yes, I do have a picture for that. Promethazine, this is also known as phenergan, right? And so this is a psychiatric medication that can be used for nausea, but it may cause a false positive pregnancy test. <laughs> That's pretty important, okay? Um, psychiatric medication that can be used for nausea, and it may cause a false positive pregnancy test, okay? So this is your promethazine, okay? The next one is going to be meclizine. Okay, meclizine. Um, I don't know if I have one. Okay, I don't think I have one for that one. Hold on.
Okay, um, I'll just mention it uh, then. Um, it's for um, Meclizine is for motion sickness and they should take it one hour prior to traveling. Okay, one hour prior to traveling. Okay, let's jump into our anti-diarrheals. Anti-diarrheals, uh, so loperamide, loperamide, loperamide. I thought I saw one for that. Um, I might not have one for that. I thought I had one, but okay. So I'll just talk about loperamide uh, for a moment. So this is an anti-diarrheal and it makes me think of that Kaopectate commercial. They're all dressed up in pink, nausea, vomit, diarrhea, diarrhea. You know that commercial I'm talking about, hopefully. Um, so watch for constipation and loperamide. And let me put the name of the medication in the chat. Loper. Okay, so watch for constipation because this is the opposite. And whenever we give medication for a reason, we should always look for the opposite effect, right? Um, and so they may. So for loperamide, it's an antidiarrheal. We have to look out for constipation. We also have to look out for rebound constipation. Be cautious if this is given to patients with C. difficile or infectious diarrhea and take 30 minutes before a meal, okay? All right, let's now get into medications that when we want the patient to have diarrhea. I know that's like, what? Yes, yeah, so sometimes we want the patient to have diarrhea. And in this case, we're talking about lactulose. Lactulose, this is a medication given by mouth. It is given to reduce ammonia levels in a patient and it works within 15 minutes, okay? It contains sugars and used with caution in patients with diabetes. Okay, so this is again, if your patient has high ammonia levels. So if you have a patient that is a liver patient, they're going to have high ammonia levels because if the liver is diseased, it cannot break down or metabolize the ammonia. So lactulose can be given to help them flush out that ammonia in the body. Okay, um, let's see. Okay. And then, so that's your lactulose. And let me see if I have the other medication. I don't see it here. Give me one second. Let me see if I can find a visual. I'll keep the I'll keep the um the lactulose up while I try to search for the other one that I'm looking for. Oh, me. And I'll also put it into the chat so you can uh, have it to look up as well, Polly. Green sulfonate. Okay, so let me just see if I have a visual for that one. So this is, um, I don't think I have a visual for it. It's going to be your k exalate. Yeah, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have a visual for the k exalate, but um, know the name polycystrine sulfonate, that is k exalate. This is going to give the patient diarrhea, but instead of removing ammonia, like in the case of lactulose, is going to remove extra um, potassium. Okay, so this is given rectally or PO, and it's meant to reduce the potassium levels, and it works within 15 minutes. Minutes. So don't give if the patient has paralytic ileus. So with any of these medications that are meant to induce diarrhea, make sure the patient is close to the bathroom, make sure they're close to the bedside commode or the bedpan is close, okay? Because they say 15 minutes, but it could work a lot faster than that, okay? Um, it could work a lot faster than that. So that is your polystyrene sulfonate, also known as K-exalate. Let's talk about your psyllium or your Metamucil. This is a dietary fiber. It causes fecal matter to expand and increase bowel movements. We will mix this with eight ounces of water, okay? Mix with eight ounces of water. 
Okay. Uh, Ducasate sodium is another medication that is a stool softener, and this may take several days to work. Okay. This may take several, several days to work. All right. Um, and this is going to be important for the patients not to to split the pills or to chew them, but this is your Ducasate sodium. Okay, um, let me see, do I have a, I don't think I have a picture for that one, but I think that one's pretty common. Okay, magnesium hydroxide salts. Magnesium hydroxide salts is a stool softener uh, and it causes the stool to expand in the intestine. Okay, um, oh, um, Okay, okay. So this is a quick sidebar. If you've ever heard of the brown cow, we're going to mil uh, mix milk of magnesia and we're going to mix warm prune juice. And that patient is going to really go to the bathroom. If this patient doesn't go after the brown cow, I see an enema in the future of the patient. Okay. All right. So with any medication that starts diarrhea, I'm not going to give to a patient that has suspected appendicitis. I'm going to question that order. I'm going to request clarification. Um, and I will not give a medication that starts diarrhea to a patient that has unknown, um, you know, abdominal pain. That's just not a good idea. That patient should be NPO. Okay. All right. Uh, let's talk about antacids or our calcium. I don't uh, do I have? I don't have a picture for that. Let's talk about antacids for a second. When we think about antacids, that's calcium carbonate. Okay, calcium carbonate. So we'll give one hour after meals with a full glass of water. It can cause hypercalcemia. Do not give with antibiotics. That's your antacids, also known as calcium carbonate. Give one hour after meals with a full glass of water. It can cause hyperglycemia. Don't give with antibiotics. Okay, the next medication we're going to talk about is going to be um, our histamine blockers, and I don't think I, I'm surprised I don't have one of those. Okay. Um, oh, I do. Okay. So the H2 blockers, histamine blockers. So your fam, uh, famity, famotidine and your simetidine. So these are used to prevent ulcers and reduce risks of stomach acid. Okay, let me just see. Okay, yes. So the names are on the slide. I just wanted to make sure. And so these, again, are used to prevent ulcers and reduces stomach acid. We give with meals or before meals. So these are your H2 blockers, your histamine 2 blockers. Okay, let's jump into our proton pump inhibitors, our PPIs. Those are the zoles, okay, omeprazole, pantoprazole. So the patient must take these PPIs 60 minutes before meals. They should not chew, and these medications may cause liver failure. Okay, semethicone, I don't think I have one for semethicone, but a lot of times that's given to patients post-surgery. Oh, I do have one for k -exalate. Sorry. All right. Let me just go to show you the k excellent one for, real quick. Um, you don't have to unload some potassium. It'll kill me. Okay. So again, k exalate or your sodium polystyrene uh, sulfonate, that's to get out the extra potassium. Okay, so I know I'm showing that, but let me just mention the semethicone. You, they will chew the tablets, take after meals. It's for a patient that has gas or flatulence, okay, that can become painful. All right, let's go to sulfocrate. Okay, here we go. Sucrophate. Okay, so sucrophate is given PO, taken on an empty stomach, do not crush or chew. It may cause hyperglycemia. Do not give with warfarin or phenoytin. Okay, do not give with warfarin or phenoytin. Okay, do not give with warfarin or phenoytin. Okay, all right, so we are almost there. Let's talk about insulins. Okay, insulins. That's going to be under endocrine. Okay. 
Okay, so this is a kind of coverall kind of slide. So um, let's talk about insulins. Okay, so when we think about um, oral anti diet, I'm sorry, we're not talking about insulins first. We're talking about oral anti diabetic agents first. So these are taken by mouth. We're thinking glucophage, uh, glispozide, um, and we're thinking. Um, Rigosotalone. Let me just see if that's on the picture here. I don't think that's on here. So let me just stick with your glucophage and your glispozide, okay, or glipozide. So for glucophage, uh, this is also your metformin, okay. When we think about glucophage, do not give 48 hours after an IV pilogram. So this is the CT with contrast because they can cause kidney damage. This is a big question that you could see on NCLEX. So your glucophage or your metformin do not give 48 hours, within 48 hours uh, after a CT scan because though that combination can cause the patient to have kidney damage. That's a really big concept to understand. So glucophage or your metformin. Okay, your uh, glipizide or gliburide must be given in the morning and it may drop blood glucose levels quickly. Have a snack available. This medication, your glipizide or your gliburide can cause jaundice. Jaundice is a yellowing of the skin, yellowing of the whites of the eyes, the sclera of the eyes, also called scleral icterus. Scleral icterus, let me just put that in the chat. Scleral ic. Icterus, if I could spell faster, that would be great. Icterus, okay, here we go. Scleral icterus, that's the whites of the eyes turning yellow uh, in a patient with jaundice, okay? So whenever we have a patient that has diabetes, uh, we want to remind them to keep a snack with them and they need simple sugars, not complex sugars, simple sugars in case they get a blood sugar drop. Now, these oral anti-diabetic agents, they are contraindicated for patients that are taking warfarin, oral contraceptives, and corticosteroids, okay? Corticosteroids, okay. Um, Okay, there's a couple more concepts that we haven't uh, kind of gone over. Um, let's see. So let me quickly mention the most important things. So, okay, oh, this was a, a metformin one. So here's the metformin uh, pictorial. If you want to, you know, later on take a look at it. This is your metformin or your glucophage. That's a, a big one. Um, so that one is there. I'm going to jump into the maternity section just to uh, give you some things to think about just in case you'll see uh, maternity and I think it's under reproductive medication. So I'll hit the, the highlights of the most important. Um, I'm not saying that the others are not important, but I'll try just because our time is almost at the end. So oxytocin, also known as pitocin, is going to be important if we are inducing labor. So we have to look at the character, the frequency, and duration of uterine contractions, and we'll stop oxytocin if the contractions are two minutes apart and last more than 60 seconds. Because if the contractions are too close together and too long, we're concerned about uterine rupture, okay? So if the patient is on oxytocin, and again, this is to start or induce labor, we're going to monitor the fetal heart rate every 15 minutes. And this medication can cause milk to be released uh, in your pregnant woman. Uh, and this medication is given via IV piggyback, and it has an antidiuretic effect that can cause water intoxication in the patient. So we have to look out for fluid overload complications. Okay. All right. So that is oxytocin. Let's talk about our tocolytic. A tocolytic is a medication that will stop labor. Okay, so it is the opposite, okay, of inducing labor. So tocolytics, uh, and I'll focus on terbutaline for this one. Terbutaline, um, 
terbutamine sulfate. To bottom line, tocolytics is, is uh, for the patient that it's not their time. They're not full term. They're not 37 weeks. So this is for preterm. So with terbutaline, it causes tachycardia in the mom and the baby, and it decreases potassium levels, okay? Um, the other important medication in pregnancy is going to be magnesium sulfate. Magnesium sulfate. I have to have a picture. I don't have a mag sulfate picture. That is a crime. That is a crime. Um, but I'll tell you about magnesium sulfate because that is one of the, the more important ones as well when we think about mother baby. This is important for your patient that has high blood pressure, gestational hypertension, or preeclampsia. So this medication decreases respirations, reflexes, and urine output. Automatically, you must be thinking because you're a good nurse, if I'm going to give a medication to a pregnant patient that causes respiratory depression, decreases their reflex and urine, well, I better be monitoring their respirations. I better be monitoring their deep tendon reflexes. I better be monitoring their urinary output. And if you thought that, you are an excellent nurse. Okay, so an indwelling catheter may be needed to monitor the urinary output while they're taking mag sulfate, and we should monitor the respirations and reflexes as well. The antidote for increased magnesium sulfate level is calcium gluconate. That's an important point. Increased magnesium sulfate level, right? If we find that they have absent deep tendon reflexes, we're going to stop magnesium sulfate, notify the provider. The antidote is calcium gluconate. Okay, calcium gluconate. All right, any questions? All right, I'm going to talk about some respiratory meds, and I don't know if all of you are here for fundamentals too, but I haven't seen any new people for fundamentals, so I'm going to keep on going. All right, so when we think about respiratory medications, that's your theophylline, and I think I have, I thought I had one for theophylline. Let me check. Does anybody know anything about theophylline? All right, well, theophylline is one that requires monitoring, just like your lithium, just like your digoxin, okay? So theophylline is a bronchodilator, and it can cause tachycardia. We'll monitor for toxicity. The normal levels for theophylline is between... 10 and 20, okay? And uh, patients should avoid caffeine in their diet when they're taking theophylline, okay? So albuterol is going to be the next medication when we're talking about respiratory meds. And albuterol is a bronchodilator. This is the emergency med. So if your patient has wheezing, difficulty breathing, tightness in their chest, they say that they can't breathe, albuterol is the medication to administer. It is for acute or severe asthma attacks, and it will cause tachycardia. They may complain that they feel their heart beating out of their chest or beating really fast, and it may cause tremors. Okay, so that is your albuterol, okay? That is a bronchodilator. Um, Montelukast, I don't think I have one for that, so I'm just gonna keep this one up. Um, this is not for severe, the Montelukast is, and I'll put the name in the chat in case you're not in Montelukast. Uh, this is also Singulair, in case you know by the name Singulair, but no Montelukast. So this is a leukotriene modifier, and it is not for acute asthma attacks. It is a maintenance medication, okay? It is a maintenance medication that should be administered in the evening. Okay, so fluticasone, fluticasone, I think I have one on that. Um, yes, so this, this fluticasone is not 
for severe asthma attacks. Okay, this is your Advair. Um, and so it has a discus. And after we open the discus, it's good for one month and never uh, exhale into the discus. Okay, bronchodilators and steroids. So let's talk about that. If the patient has two medications, bronchodilators and uh, steroids, they'll take the bronchodilator first to open up their airways. And then, so they'll take one puff bronchodilator, wait one minute, second puff bronchodilator, wait two to five minutes, and then take the first puff of their steroid, then one minute and wait one minute, and then the second puff of their steroid, okay? Because they take the bronchodilator first to open up the airways, open up the airways, okay? Open up the airways, okay? Beclomethazone. Beclomethazone is another medication, and I thought I had a picture for that one. Maybe I looked for that one before. Okay, so I may not have uh, Beclomethazone. I'm going to put the name in the chat just because that's an important one for you to know. And thank you for uh, staying with me. I know it's been a long, long couple hours here, but there's a lot with uh, pharmacology. All right, so a uh, beclomethazone is a corticosteroid, or it's a corticosteroid, and it's used for chronic asthma. And when something is chronic, it's long term, right? So a uh, uh, beclomethazone helps to produce surfactant and they should rinse their mouth after administration. And that is the deal with any of these oral corticosteroids. We must rinse the mouth, teach the patient to rinse the mouth because we are afraid of thrush, oral candidiasis. Okay. All right. Guafenicin. Guafenicin. K okay, is an expectorant. It helps the patient expectorate or cough up any secretions. So they should take this medication with a full glass of water. Increased fluid is needed to help loosen those secretions. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to now go to your mental health medications, and I think that's the last, um, the last ones. Okay the last ones. Okay, so let's go to our mental health section. And again, you all have access to all of these resources and you have access to me. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, send me a text. Okay, so let's talk about our medications here. Um, we talked about MAOIs a bit already, so I won't uh, touch on those. Um, let me just see which ones. Okay. Let's talk about the benzodiazepine, benzodiazepines. I don't think that's really weird that I don't have a picture, but I'm probably not seeing it just because I'm looking so quickly, but I'm going to put it into the chat. Benzodiazepines. Sometimes they are called benzos for short. Okay, when we think about our benzos, I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, when we think about our benzos, we're thinking about alprazolam, clonazepam, diazepam, lorazepam. So anything that ends in zepam, right? These are your benzos, your benzodiazepines. So they are very addictive. They're for short-term use only and do not stop taking them abruptly. And we have to monitor our patients for respiratory depression, okay? Respiratory depression. Also, um, when we think about... Um, the psychiatric medications, um, we have to look out when we're giving our patient anti-anxiety medications, we have to look out for the side effects of altered vital signs, 
blurry vision, constipation, confusion, dry mouth, dizziness, stasis of urine, meaning the urine is standing still, they're not emptying their bladder, as well as sedation, okay? So that those are the anti-anxiety medications, okay? Um, the next medications uh, that I want to talk about that are not benzos that work on anxiety are going to be your buspirone. Okay, buspirone is used for obsessive compulsive disorder, PTSD, and it has a lower sedative effect than the benzodiazepines. And this medication should not be taken with grapefruit juice. So to, today I've already mentioned about three or four medications to not take with grapefruit juice. So a good strategy if you're like, man, I can't remember, when in doubt, I would say don't give them grapefruit juice, okay? Uh, so that is buspirone. The next psychiat uh, psychiatric med that we'll talk about is zolpidem. Zolpidem. Okay, zolpidem is used for insomnia and it's a medication that should be administered immediately before sleep. This is another one that do not give if they're going to operate heavy machinery or drive or do anything that requires mental alertness. Headaches could be a reported side effect, and patients can become psychologically dependent. Sleepwalking is common, so that makes me think that safety is an issue. Okay, safety is an issue. Okay, let's talk about antidepressants. Okay, antidepressants. I do have a visual aid for the antidepressants, actually. So let me um, bring up that so you can take a look. All right, I'm always uh, putting in a plug for visual aids, especially for your visual learners. When we think about our antidepressants, we have to look out for side effects of agitation, anorexia, blurred vision, constipation, dry mouth, or sleep disturbances. So the SSRIs are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Okay, and so we're thinking your citalopram, your cetraline, and these medications may cause suicidal ideation, and they may take four to six weeks to work. And that's something that with all of our psychiatric medications, we have to know that they may not work that quickly. It could take, you know, a, a couple weeks, maybe even up to a month for the medications to start kicking in where the patient will see an effect. But the other thing that's important is once those medications start taking effect, the patient may have an increased mood, not because they're getting better, but because they're like, now I have enough strength that I can carry out my suicide plan. So we have to really be careful about that in our patients and look out for that. Okay, so here's our SSRIs, our selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and uh, we don't want to give with disulfiram. Now, disulfiram, that's an important medication. I'm going to put that in the chat. Disulfiram. Disulfiram is also known as antabuse. That is a medication that's given to someone that has gone through uh, in-house uh, detox treatment for alcohol. If your patient is taking disulfiram, they must abstain from all alcohol. That includes alcohol found in mouthwash and you know hand sanitizer, hair gel, because what will happen is they will violently react by vomiting. Okay, and that is the why the medication is given because they're supposed to keep them away from drinking alcoholic beverages. Okay, so but all alcohol must be avoided by the patient, else they will become sick. All right, so going back to our psychiatric meds, we talked about our SSRIs, we mentioned uh, MAOIs, uh, those are antidepressants, and the big thing for MAOIs are the dietary restrictions, okay, and let me just repeat those dietary restrictions, no tyramine, so no organ meats, no bacon, sausage, bologna, pepperoni, salami, any luncheon meat with nitrates, okay, and let me bring up the MAOI picture, just as a reminder, um, 
They can't have bananas, avocados, or raisins. They can't have aged cheese, no yogurt, no coffee, teas, or chocolate, no soy sauce, tofu, teriyaki. Don't go to any Asian restaurant. That's the bottom line, okay? Um, no nuts, peanut butter, or pumpkin seeds, okay? Okay, with all of your antipsychotic medications, look out for side effects of extrapyramidal symptoms and tardive dys dyskinesia. Those are the extra movements that the patient can have. All right, so we have had a fire hose of knowledge. I am going to go around the room, see if everybody's still alive, and uh, to see if there's any questions. Let me uh, stop recording at this time.